Shall we get started? Uh, I think we should probably start by introducing ourselves. So, Steve, do you want to go first? Yes, uh, by all means. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Steve Johnson, and um, I am one of uh, two criminal course designers at the ICCA. Uh, uh, the other person, actually, um, is also called Steve, uh, by pure and there he is and uh, at the moment we are both actively engaged in designing the advocacy course that uh, those on part two of the uh, icc a bar course will uh, uh, will come will come to um i'm a, 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 a i'm a, an ex barrister now i suppose an ex practicing barrister i suppose i should say i was at the manchester bar for 25 years um i uh, actually did both uh, crime and civil because uh, in those days that's exactly what you would do you would do absolutely anything and everything but in the last um, 12 years or so i specialized in uh, crime uh, both prosecuting and defending uh, and a lot of the work that i did at the bar was uh, uh, in, in relation to um, sex cases uh, i was a specialist rape prosecutor amongst other things so that's me in a very short nutshell. Uh, hello, I'm I'm the other Steve. I'm Steve Wells. Uh, like Steve, I was uh, a practice at the bar, uh, and again, like doing crime, absolutely anything that anybody would pay me for. Um, and again, like him, I came to specialise in crime. Um, so we, we have very similar backgrounds, although in, in different parts of the country. I'm from the south, Steve's from the north, but um, as far as I'm aware, the criminal procedure rules are the same, uh, whichever part of England you're in. So that's, um, that, that's our background, and we're here today to talk to you uh, just a little bit uh, about submissions advocacy. Um, and naturally we don't know how much experience all of you have so we're intending to start with the absolute basics and if for some of you it means that at the start what we're talking about is as to be not worth hearing i do apologize for that uh, but i assure you we shall move on in in due course so steve help us if you would um, if you're thinking about people starting out in doing submissions advocacy, whether that be uh, in court or in moots or anything like that, what is the most common problem that you see um, that is fixable? Mm, fixable. Yes, uh, well, it is fixable eventually, I would say. Uh, my my experience is um, particularly uh, having taught students now for something like 12 years in advocacy, that when the student uh, first comes to you, the main problem that they have, in my view, is that they don't actually do advocacy. What they do is reading. Um, and, <laughs> And so the student will uh, come to the session very often extremely well prepared, uh, having done many hours of uh, preparation. But what they brought with them is, in essence, a full script. And then what they proceed to do is to read everything out, uh, written long script or typed out, exactly as it appears on the page. Uh, and that is a, a, a real problem and a common problem for the student that is beginning to uh, embark upon advocacy. The cause of it, of course, is, is lack of confidence uh, and uh, the belief that if they have a full script in front of them, uh, they can't go wrong, uh, that it will be perfectly acceptable, they won't forget anything, and the argument that they want to make, the submission they want to make, will, will come across. Um, the problem with it, of course, is that if you turn up with a script that you read out, it won't take very long before you lose your audience or 
to put it another way, before you lose the, the, the judge or the tribunal of fact. Um, when, you, when you read something, uh, what very often uh, tends to happen, first of all, is that you will speak far too quickly. So because, you, because you're so confident, because you have a script in front of you, you'll just read it out quickly uh, without proper pacing or pausing, and so it will be lost. Um, very often when people uh, read scripts out, it, it will sound a little bit fake. There'll be uh, false intonations, it'll be monotone, it will sound uh, unnatural. And so as a consequence of which, the submission that you're seeking to make uh, doesn't come across because all you're doing is embarking upon a reading exercise and that I've always found Steve over over 12 years teaching students and something like 25 years now uh, training in uh, advocacy th that is something that is very difficult to fix and no matter how often you tell a student not to do it but the answer to it of course it is to uh, encourage the student, first of all, to have confidence in themselves and confidence in the submission that they're going to make. And secondly, on a more practical basis, it's to encourage the students to come to a submission where uh, what they uh, want to say is summarized much more in bullet points, that it's well spaced out uh, and that it follows a uh, logical order so that you can get your submission across. I, I, I don't know whether you agree with that, Steve. I, I, I do. I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of things that I'll add to that. One is that by the time you've read the papers and reread the papers and thought about the submissions that you're going to make, and then if you've gone to the trouble of actually writing out a verbatim script of what you're going to say, doing all of those things has fixed both the facts in the brief and what you want to say about them in your head. And the thing that I often do when I notice that somebody is reading is I just come out from behind the bench where I'm sitting and, and I take their script away and just say, yeah. carry on. And they do. Um, I, I, I've never yet met somebody who, when deprived of their script, actually couldn't go on. Um, because making the script has set it in your mind, you know exactly what you want to say, um, and you'll be fine. The other thing I want to do is to agree with what Steve said about how terrible reading things out uh, is to look at and to listen to. To be able to read a uh, text off a page of life as if you were saying it as if it's just occurred to you is an extraordinary skill that very few people have. I, I tell you, some years ago, I went uh, to a community centre on the Isle of Dogs to go to an evening with Sir Ian McKellen uh, in which he, um, he he spent, I don't know, an hour and a half um, recounting anecdotes and uh, he had a scrapbook with him and he read out reviews that he'd received, particularly bad reviews that, that he had uh, received. And it, it was all very entertaining. It was very funny. And when he finished, um, he came down into the audience and wandered around and chatted to people. And while he was doing that, I took the opportunity to go on the stage and look at his scrapbook. And there was nothing in it. Absolutely <laughs> nothing. Because even if you're Sir Ian McKellen, you can't read out text from the page and make it sound good. And he knows that, um, which is why there was nothing in his scrapbook. Um, so just don't do it. It's awful. Now, Steve, about reading from a script, um, you, you, you mentioned uh, the pace at which people speak when yes. they're reading. And I agree with you that that is one of the most common problems that we see in advocates early in their career. Um, what I want to say about pace is that it's really important. 
good day in court, you will make your submissions. And at the end of the hearing, the judge will give a decision with reasons. And on a good day, not only will the judge find in your favor, but you will hear the judge in giving reasons, speaking back to you your own words. Because if you were speaking at a pace that enabled the judge to get a note down of what you were saying, it is the easiest thing in the world from the judge's point of view to incorporate your submissions into his or her reasons for the decision. And that's what you want to happen. So you've got to speak slowly enough to enable your tribunal, whether that's the judge or magistrates or the jury or the panel judging your moot, to get a, a, at least the rudiments of a note of what you're saying down. If it's too fast to take a note of it, there is absolutely no point in saying it. You might as well stay at home. So um, slow down. Many people, when I say to them, you're going too fast, slow down for a sentence or so, and then speed up again. Uh, and and it, it, it becomes a, a ridiculous sort of ratchet effect where they go faster, I slow them down, they go faster, I slow them down, they go faster, I slow them down. Um, and I think the reason why they're doing that is that as far as they're concerned, they're not speaking quickly. Um, and that's because of some interesting um, neurophysiology that I'm going to tell you about now. Um, all of you know what adrenaline is. It, it's that stuff that makes you feel hyped up and ready to go. Uh, and you have a lot of adrenaline in you when you're in court and you're just about to speak. And you're aware that it makes you breathe faster. It makes your heart breathe beat faster. It increases the blood flow to your, your muscles. Those are the physical effects of adrenaline. Less well known is the psychotropic effect of adrenaline. Adrenaline acts on your mind to make it appear that time is passing more slowly than it in fact is. If you don't believe me about this, after this session, go out on a bicycle or a motorbike and have a road accident. Just get knocked off by a car or a truck or something. I've done this loads of times, so you don't have to. Uh, what happens is you fly through the air thinking, oh, I'm having a road accident. That's bad. I expect I'm going to land somewhere over there. I expect it'll hurt. Um, and then you land and, and it, it does hurt. But you have loads of time to think about those things, despite the fact that you're probably in the air for less than a second. Um, because that's what adrenaline does to you. It makes it feel as if time is going very slowly. So it makes you think that you're speaking more slowly than you actually are. Take that into account. When you're in court, the general rule is that if you think you're speaking a bit too loudly and a bit too slowly, you've probably got it about right. That, that's a very uh, interesting point, Steve, that you make about uh, adrenaline. And um, when we have time, remind me to tell you the story of when I made the BBC News uh, as a consequence of an accident on the M62 and my feelings as the car hit the taxi and then uh, flipped up in the air uh, over a fence and landed on the four wheels in the field uh, next to the motorway. And you're absolutely right. It, it, it didn't feel like a second when it was happening. So <laughs> two very interesting. I, I, I think you've probably just found out about Steve. One is he is full of fascinating anecdotes. And two, never accept a lift from him. Um, <laughs> the, 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 we, we, we've got a question here uh, about how you can build confidence to, um, to present without a script. It's the easiest thing in the world. Get rid of the script. Um, 
write out whatever you want to write out. If you want to write out a script, fine. I recommend that actually you just write out bullet points. Whatever it is you write, you have to trust me on this. You don't need it. So by all means, when you're doing your advocacy, have it in front of you, face down. That way, you know that if you have one of those awful moments that we all have sometimes when you're standing up in the middle of the courtroom and you're thinking there is a silence and the reason why there's a silence is that I'm meant to be saying something and I haven't the faintest idea what I was going to say next. Then you can turn over your piece of paper, look down at your notes and it'll put you back on track. But most of the time, you don't need it. And the only way to convince yourself that you don't need it is have a go. Just try doing it without the script and absolutely trust me, you will be fine. Can, can I just add to that, Steve? Um, in the early days, I would also suggest that you practice before you actually go to the submission session, uh, your submission without having the script. So. Um, because, uh, I mean, coming back to uh, what we were saying uh, earlier and about the, the, the lack of confidence, uh, obviously, if you practice, it gives you more confidence. But what the practice should actually be doing is um, you practicing your ability to not so much necessarily remember each and everything that you want to say, but your understanding of what it is that you're saying uh, and um, if you have a, a, a full-length script very often that understanding will disappear because you're just simply focusing upon reading but but if you have confidence in yourself and if you have confidence in the fact that you actually understand the arguments that you're making it will uh, help a, a great deal Yes, I'm just going to deal with, 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 with a couple of questions. Uh, Diti, you're, you're saying that in moots, you're short of time. So you speak quickly so that you can pack in all your uh, submissions into the time uh, available. Um, I, I'm going to say to you something that you're really not going to want to hear. And that is bin some of your submissions. Because some of them, and again, you're not going to want to hear this, aren't very good. Um, there, there are a limited number of things that you can say that are actually going to change the mind of your tribunal and win the case, the moot, or whatever it is for you. Say those things. And there are two things that I would commend to you um, to get you uh, in a position to do that. One is a word processor. Uh, I use Microsoft Word, other word processes are available. Uh, the other is sleep. Okay, so what you do is you prepare your submissions in note form or whatever it is um, on a word processor. Don't print them out yet. That's far, it's far too early. Then you go to bed, you get a good night's sleep and you read it in the morning and you read it with your judge head screwed on. And you ask yourself, if I were the judge listening to this, which parts of this would actually change the way I think about this case? And the bits that don't pass that test, highlight them, press the delete button on your keyboard, and you will end up with submissions that will fit into the time allowed without you having to speak at 90 miles an hour. Um, Steve, um, Cheryl asks, for a person who speaks fast in general, I, bl I blame partly on being Scottish, what practical advice would you give to help slow down? Is a pause too obvious? Steve, give us your thoughts on pauses. Pauses can be extremely effective. Do you see? Um, <laughs> uh, pausing is one of the um, 
uh, is one of the main tools in an actor's toolkit. Um, pausing can be very effective when deployed at the right time. Uh, if you uh, just use pauses all of the time, then it's boring. But if you are talking at a, at a reasonable pace and you want to emphasize a point, very often uh, a very good thing to do is just as you're reaching that point, pause. And you will uh, regain possibly the interest of the uh, tribunal that is uh, hopefully hanging on to your every word. Yep. I, I think that is good advice. Um, if you have any doubts about that, uh, go on to YouTube. You'll find plenty of speeches by Barack Obama and by Tony Blair. Um, it's not just those two, but they're the two that, that, that spring to mind. Uh, listen to any speech by either of those very successful politicians. And what you will notice is that there is almost as much pause as there is speech. People worry that pausing makes it look as if you've forgotten what you were going to say next, or you don't know where you're going. That could not be further from the truth. Uh, watch Obama or, or Blair, and what you will see is that pausing is powerful. Pausing makes you look as if you are somebody who has no worries at all, about being heckled or interrupted or losing the attention of your audience. If you pause, the message you're giving out is, I know that I can go silent for as long as I like. and everybody will sit in silence and wait for the next thing I'm going to say. So, use pauses. Um, is, is it appropriate to be emotive in tone when making a submission? Steve, what would you say about that? Uh, I'm sorry, Steve, I, I didn't catch the question. Well, I'm just reading out a, a, a question from, from Jade. Is it appropriate to be emotive in tone when making a submission? Um, it is it is appropriate to sound sincere when you're making a submission. Uh, I, I would suggest is the answer to that. Uh, a very important part of uh, persuasive advocacy is to ensure that you actually sound as if you believe in the submission that you're making, because there is nothing worse than delivering a submission uh, where the way in which you're delivering it makes it sound as if you're uh, either as if you either don't believe what you're saying or you're not uh, invested in the submission that you are making so uh, it's a very important aspect of advocacy to at least fake sincerity even in fact <laughs> you're not being uh, particularly sincere um if you start becoming emotive, then you've gone too far because uh, at that stage, what is happening is that you are weakening your presentation and you're weakening the impact of the submission that you're making. So, so by all means, really sound as if you are engaged in the submission that you're making but don't go, as they say, OTT or over the top. Um, let me just give you actually a, 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 an example of where it wasn't a very good idea to be emotive. Many years ago, um, there was a barrister in Manchester who was senior, experienced, uh, and she, uh, uh, she she did a, a lot of uh, sex cases. I say she, she or he. Um, and uh, there was an occasion where a, a case was being opened. And the opening went something along the lines of uh, these 
members of the jury, these three men picked up the complainant. They bundled her into their car. They took her to a dark alleyway where each and every one of them had their way with her. They then took her back into the car. They drove off and they as they uh, as they were driving along the road they opened the door and flung her out of the car like a discarded condom that's emotive and at that point the judge stepped in sent the jury out rebuked counsel discharged the jury and the trial had to start all over again on another occasion yeah, I think that's, that's a very good example of going too far. Um, but on, on, on the, the, the subject of, of, of sincerity, it's important to remember that wherever you are, whether it's in a moot or, or in a court, uh, the thing that you are trying to influence is a human being, not a some kind of law computer. Uh, sometimes, particularly in moots, people get so bogged down in the minutiae of the law that they forget to engage with the person that they are trying to persuade. Um, you're not going to persuade your judge, your panel, the magistrates, the jury, whoever it is, unless you do the things that you all know how to do. Imagine that you're with a group of friends and sometime later in the evening, you are all going to go to a restaurant together. And there is a restaurant that you would particularly like to go to and you would like to persuade everybody else to go there. What you're going to do when you talk about that restaurant is you're going to sound animated. You're going to sound interested in it. You're going to make eye contact with the people that you are trying to persuade. You are going to gauge their reactions to what you're saying, so you can work out which of them are already on side, which of them need a bit more persuasion. What you do in court is absolutely no different from that. You've got to make eye contact with your judge. You have got to sound engaged with what you're saying. You have got to be engaging so that uh, the judge will take notice of what you are saying. Um, Dolores, th this links into your question. Can you give some tips on body language when speaking in court? Um, first tip, which, which is very, very important, is from now on, none of you are ever to watch courtroom scenes in TV dramas or in films ever again, okay? Because in all of them, it seems to me, even when they're supposed to be in English courts, people move about all over the place. We don't do that stuff. We stand still. Um, you might be on your feet for some time. The important thing to do is to get comfortable. And in general, that involves standing with your feet about as far apart as your shoulders and relaxing. Let your arms hang loose at your sides, balance your head uh, on the top of your, your spine. Talk to an Alexander Technique teacher. They talk a lot about these things. Um, and then bear in mind that it's what you're saying that you want people to take notice of. In general, what you are doing is likely to distract and detract from that. We all have bad habits. We fiddle with our glasses, with our hair. We have pens that we fiddle around with. We, we do all sorts of things that take the focus off of what we are saying. So my view is that the best body language is no body language. Just stand there and say what you need to say. If you are going to use your hands at all, I would recommend that you use them 
in exactly the same way as Steve described using a pause. In your closing speech, you might want to say to the jury, members of the jury, I apologize in advance, this is going to be quite a long speech. And I have a lot of things that I need to say to you. But the first thing I want to say to you is that if there is only one thing that you remember from this speech, please let it be this. Pause and then say it. But that's the only hand gesture you do in the whole of the speech. If you do that, it works and it points up what you're saying. If you just wave your hands around in general, like I'm doing now, it just gets in the way and it's annoying. So um, generally, um, can, I just, can I just say one thing in relation to um, body language, Steve, uh, and, and that is what not to do. Um, what not to do is to treat the courtroom as if it were your own living room. Um, and uh, and there's one particular fault that uh, I've seen in relation to a, a number of barristers, um, and that is where you're you're standing on one leg, whilst uh, the other you're resting your knee on the seat next to where you are. So 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 and and um, I'll tell you why I I I'll tell you why I, I think of that. First of all, because um, that there was someone that I, I used to uh, practice with who uh, very often would adopt that pose in court. But I saw it very recently. I actually saw it last night when I, I'm watching at the moment the trial of Oscar Pistorius on uh, BBC Two, or Parter as it, as it happens. And if you go and look at that, just have a look at the body language of prosecution counsel I think he's a I think he's called a man by the name of Kel and that's exactly what he does he rests his knee on the chair uh, next to him uh, don't do it yeah um, remember that the, the court is formal that doesn't necessarily mean that it's stiff uh, it doesn't mean that it's unnatural. And this gives me a chance to talk about one of my favorite bugbears, uh, which is people using a completely different vocabulary in court from what they would use in real life. Um, the most annoying and regularly heard example of this, which I'm afraid you will hear on those films and TV dramas, is I put it to you. Nobody in the course of a conversation has said, I put it to you since King Edward VII was on the throne. Historical footnote, he died in 1910. Um, uh, nobody speaks like that. Um, I think you find Charles Lawton did in Witness for the Prosecution, hmm? Steve. <laughs> I think you find Charles Lawton did in Witness for the Prosecution. Yeah, Steve. That was a film, it's fiction. We've talked about this before, fiction, reality, two different oh, yeah. things. I'll, I'll draw you that diagram again. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the bottom of this in the end. Um, but um, get, just use the language that you would use if you were talking to a friend. Obviously don't swear, don't use slang, but really you don't have to speak a strange kind of cod edwardian english um it, it's horrible <laughs> and um makes my toes curl i cringe every time i hear i put it to you now ellen yes yeah I, I absolutely agree with that and uh um obviously we, we've talked about this before and um one of the things i always say for example is i've never exited a vehicle in my life I've got out of the car loads of times, but I've never exited a vehicle. And uh, there the can very often uh, be uh, the, tem the temptation to use phrases that you would not even dream of using during the course of, a, of an everyday conversational language. Um, 
the, the other thing to remember is, I think, uh, which is important, is always make sure that you're always yourself. Um, I, I, as Steve mentioned, I'm I'm from uh, from Manchester, and uh, I knew a barrister once, a very senior barrister uh, and a very able barrister. Uh, and he was from Lancashire, and he had a broad Lancashire accent. Uh, and uh, we would be talking outside of court, and, and, and he would be, you know, he'd be, he'd be talking, right, right, Steve, well, uh, I think in, in a few moments we'll, uh, we'll go into court, and uh, I'll, I'll open the case on behalf of the prosecution. And then he'd walk into court, and he'd go, uh, my lord, Members of the jury, in this matter, I appear on behalf of the prosecution. And he literally changed uh, completely from the person that he was. And the problem with that is that eventually you do get caught out. It does sound artificial. It does sound fake. And of course, you can't, you can't help but slip back into the way in which you speak naturally. So it is very, very important that you're always yourself when you are in court. Mine's, of course, as Steve says, the swear words. Now, um, Eleanor, you've asked a couple of questions about structure, and we're, we've only got just over 15 minutes to go, so I think it's very important that we move on to this now. Um, I have two things to say about structure when I'm sitting as your judge. One, have one. Two, Tell me what it is. Steve, anything to add to that? Well, uh, I like it so far, Steve. Um, yes, uh, it's absolutely imperative that at the outset of the submission that you make, that you give an indication to the judge of uh, the, the structure that you intend to adopt for that particular submission. Um, not least of which, so that the judge doesn't have a sinking feeling at the beginning of your submission that you're never ever going to stop talking. Now, if you, if you tell the judge at the beginning um, what the uh, structure of your submission is going to be and uh, in, in, in short form uh, and the order in which you're going to take them, then at the outset you have uh, given a framework within which not only will you be working but the judge can also uh, confidently follow as well so uh, so that's important um but as i say uh keep it succinct only give an outline of uh, what your submissions are at the beginning please don't go into detail in relation to any of the submissions that you might be making so for example if um if you're appearing on behalf of the prosecution uh, in, in a in a bail application, you, you when you're setting out the structure, then you might say something along the lines of, uh, "Well, uh, well, Your Honour, I appear on behalf of the Crown. Uh, the defendant is seeking bail in this case. The Crown object to bail on the following three grounds, and then set out uh, what those grounds might be." and then say, uh, if I may, I'll turn to the first ground first. Okay. So, so that first. deals with what I call the macro structure, the order in which you are going to deal with the points that you're going to make as you move through your submissions. Within each point, you also need to uh, take pay attention to what I call the micro structure. Now, all of you have years of education behind you, and I would imagine that you are all very good at writing essays. And you know the structure of an essay. You start with the title, you advance a series of arguments, and those arguments culminate in the conclusion that you reach at the end of the essay. In some court, that doesn't work. Because while I am listening to your arguments, I'm sitting thinking, well, where is this going? Why are you saying this to me? 
So for advocacy, whether it be in a moot or submissions in court, you have got to reverse the order of what you are used to. You start with the submission. Your Honour, in my submission, this is a case that can probably be dealt with by way of a suspended sentence. And then you go on to give the reasons that lead to that conclusion. Uh, I, I did an advocacy workshop a few uh, weeks ago, and I had a number of people in front of me doing it. Uh, uh, one of them was a senior university lecturer. Um, lovely man, very eloquent, and he made beautiful submissions. And at the end, I said to him, that was absolutely lovely and a really good essay. You went through all the points you wanted to make and you gave me the conclusion at, at the end. In order to make it into good submissions, turn everything the other way around and it'll be great. Steve, anything else on structure? Um, well, I think I, I, I think it's important to recognise what, what what a submission actually is. So, um, the submission essentially falls into two parts, doesn't it? it it's uh, your argument, or to put it another way, what is it I'm going to say, and then secondly the evidence, if you like, that you want to uh, adduce in support of the argument that you make. And wh when I'm teaching submission advocacy, I tend to call it what and why. What am I going to say and why am I saying it? And, and my advice always to students is that when they're preparing their submission, that's the uh, approach that they should take in relation to each point that they want to make in, in relation to the submission. What am I going to say and why am I going to say it? So for example, take, take, taking a very, very simple uh, example uh, of, of a submission in a, in a plea of mitigation. Uh, more often than not, you are hoping that you're able to say to the judge, the defendant pleaded guilty. Yeah, okay, <laughs> all right, thanks very much, he pleaded guilty. But that, that's just, that's just the, the, the argument, the, the, the point that you want to make. What you, uh, when you're making a submission, what you then move on to is, is why you want to say it. So, so you might say, uh, uh, you, you might um, take, to take your point, Steve, turn it, turn it on its head. So in fact, what you might want to say is something along the lines of, your Honour, with, without any doubt, the defendant is extremely remorseful uh, uh, about this uh, offence. And Your Honour may feel that that is supported no better than by the fact that when he appeared before the court the very first time, he tendered his plea of guilty. Uh, and given that his plea was tendered at such an early stage, Your Honour may feel uh, th that he is therefore entitled for full credit uh, for, the, for the plea that he has tendered. It's perhaps not surprising that he pleaded guilty at the first available opportunity, because when he was interviewed by the police, he fully confessed to what he did. Uh, and of course, as Your Honour knows from the interview transcript, at the very end, he said that he was extremely sorry for what he'd done and he wished that he could take it all back. I don't know whether you do, Steve, that's a submission. I, I do. That, that is a submission. So we've talked now about the, the macro structure and the micro structure of your submissions. So with somewhat less than 10 minutes to go, I think we now need to move on to talking about uh, the thing that is going to tend to pull your beautifully crafted structure um, out of shape. And that, of course, is questions uh, from your judge. Uh, and 
I've already seen some questions in the chat panel about how do you deal with questions from the judge? So, Steve, your thoughts on that? Number one, don't panic. Um, you, you should expect there to be questions. Um, generally speaking, if a judge is asking a question, in fact, it tends to be helpful rather than unhelpful because what the judge is, is doing is that he or she is communicating to you what is on their mind and, and wondering what you might have to say in relation to a particular point. So, so if you always bear in mind that generally speaking, the motivation of the person that is asking the question is not to upset you, it's not to uh, be unpleasant, it's not to throw you off your stride, it's a genuine attempt, uh, more often than not, to uh, tell you what the judge is thinking or what the judge is being concerned about. So that's the, fir the first thing. I think the second thing is, and it really follows on, is that it's extremely important that you do not uh, anticipate what the question is going to be. In other words, make sure that you actually listen to the whole of the question before you attempt a, an answer. Um, a, a, and that word listen is absolutely key because in my view, listening is one of the major techniques that a really good advocate employs, the ability to listen, regardless of the nature of the advocacy in which you embark. So it's very important that you listen to the question. And, and, and thirdly, bear in mind that you're not obliged to immediately answer uh, the question as it's asked. You are entitled to take a little bit of time to reflect upon what is being said before then uh, going on and, and hopefully in, uh, telling the judge uh, what your answer is in relation to the question that he or she has raised. Um, yes, I agree with all of that. My rule number one about questions is answer them. I agree with what Steve said, that the judge tends to be helping you by answering your question, by steering you towards the things that are on his or her mind that are standing between him or her giving judgment in your favour. I need you to deal with this so that I can find in your favour. Um, so answer the question. A lot of people panic and they find ways of trying to not answer the question. I was going to come on to that later. Yep, yeah, well, you probably were going to come onto it later, but the judge has asked you a question and wants an answer to it. Now, there are techniques for not giving a full answer, but you must give an answer. Sometimes your answer to a judicial intervention can be, Your Honor, in a nutshell, the answer to that question is yes. And I shall go on to explain why the answer is yes in due course. That's fine because you've answered the question. Um, I, I, a lot of people simply don't answer the question. And I say to those people, imagine that you are in a conversation with somebody else and you ask them a question and their response to that question amounts one way or another to, I'm not going to answer that question. How would you feel about that? Would you feel that you were still having a comfortable conversation with that person? Would you feel rebuffed? Would you think that that was rather rude? Would you feel that your relationship with this person is now more strained than it was before? I think I would. And that's the last thing that you want to happen to the relationship between you and the judge. The other thing that you might be scared of 
is that answering the question is going to pull your structure out of shape. And this is where your notes face down in front of you that I was talking about earlier come back into play. Answer the judge's question, then have one of those awful blank moments where you, you stand and think, where on earth was I? Turn over your piece of paper, have a look and think, oh, yes, I was there and pick up again from where you were and you will be absolutely fine. Um, Scott Smith, do you try to preempt all the questions you're likely to get beforehand? Uh, yes, of course you do. I, I always say that one of the most important uh, aspects of preparation for advocacy is mind reading. So if you're going to make a bail application, look at the papers, look into the mind of your judge and ask yourself, why does this judge want to lock my client up? And when you've identified that, deal with those objections to bail. Those are the, the hurdles that you need to get over. So yes, you will do your best to read the judge's mind and deal with everything that the judge is going to want to ask about. But if this goes back to the point that Steve made earlier, the judge is doing you a favor by asking you a question because you haven't necessarily thought of everything that is bothering the judge. And there the judge is telling you it's a free gift. So listen to the question and respond to it. Uh, and to never be, uh, never be frightened to ask the judge for a moment or two to gather your thoughts and to find where you want to go next. If if you have been in some way thrown off course by the question that was asked. Yes. Um, in my experience in court, it tends to be the most experienced and most confident advocates who are most likely to say to the judge, Your Honour, may I have a few moments to gather my thoughts? Or when they've been asked a question, Your Honour, may I think about that for a moment? Um, and again, as I was saying earlier, uh, with those pauses, that doesn't make you look weak. It makes you look like somebody who is confident, who is prepared to let the room go silent for a short while, while you think, so that you are in the best possible position to say what you need to say next. I think it is now 12.55. I'm, I'm sorry, I know that there are some questions that, that we haven't dealt with. I, I'm very sorry. Um, I've done my best to deal with them. Um, but of course, feel free to email in any further questions that you have and we'll do what we can uh, about um, dealing with them. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, Steve and I are appearing in another session in five minutes time, but that one is going to be much more adversarial. And uh, I think we're going to ask you to decide at the end of it um, which of us won. Um, and of course, you don't have to vote for me. You don't have to. I'm not putting any pressure on you. You, you could, of course, vote for the other Steve. I mean, people have been known to do that. Um, and, you know, they're not bad people. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm just, I don't want to try to influence you in any way about that. But it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.